Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Chester Ronning Center webinar. My name, for those who don't know me, is Ian Wilson. There I am there. I serve as director of the Chester Ronning Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life. Today's webinar is the first of several events that we are hosting this week in conjunction with the Augustana 110 celebrations, marking the 110th anniversary of this educational institution in Camros. The Augustana campus of the University of Alberta, which was preceded by the Camrose Lutheran College, sits on Treaty 6 territory. This land where I sit right now is traditionally known as Asiniscau Sapisis or Stony Creek, and it is a traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples. The land has provided a traveling route and home to the Muscochese Nahiwak, Nitsitapi, Nakoda, and Sutina nations, the Metis, and other indigenous peoples. Their spiritual and practical relationships to the land create a rich heritage for our learning and for our life as a community here at the university. Today, we have the privilege of chatting with esteemed Albertan filmmaker, Tom Radford. There's Tom right there. He's actually a U of A alum. Radford's career in film has spanned 45 years. He has received the Order of Canada Honor and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal. And he has won the Billington Lifetime Achievement Award for his contributions to the Alberta film industry. His films have documented Canadian history, nature, and sport, among other topics. In the late 1970s, he came to know Chester Ronning, the Canadian educator, politician, and diplomat who served as principal of Camrose Lutheran College from 1927 to 1942. Radford's film about Ronning, China Mission, which was produced in 1980, is among the best memorials we have to Ronning himself, his life, and his work. Tomorrow evening, June 9th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, for those who might be viewing from other time zones, we'll be screening the film online in its entirety. So please mark your calendar for that special event tomorrow evening. But today, before we have some conversation with Tom, we'd like to give you a sneak peek into the film to provide some good context for our chat and hopefully to encourage you to take in the full film tomorrow evening. Also, thanks so much to the Jean and Peter Lockheed Performing Arts Center and to the Augustana Alumni Office for co-sponsoring this event with us today and for supporting the backstage tech, so to speak. We truly appreciate their support and for making these webinars run so smoothly. And now please enjoy, please enjoy this abridged version of the film China Mission before we welcome our special guest, Tom Radford. Daughter, Alice is my sister, yeah. and Alice is Julia's daughter. You know how I used to put you to sleep? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> At the bottom of your foot, like that. <laughs> August 1978, a family reunion on the shores of Great Spirit Lake, Iowa. This is Chester Ronning, 85 years old. He's preparing for the baptism of his great-grandchild. The attic of his house is a store of treasures. Photographs, rare porcelains, the tiger he shot with a Maharaja. But the real treasures are the memories of a life. Norway, India, 
Vietnam, China. Chester's parents, Hannah and Halva Ronning, Lutheran missionaries, arrived on the China coast in December of 1891. Their destination, 700 miles up the Yangtze River, was the city of Hankow where they were to learn Chinese. They founded their mission in the ancient walled city of Fancheng. Within three years, they had built a church, a school, and a home. Here, six children were born. Four of them attended the family reunion in Iowa. What is an old man who first grows whiskers before he grows teeth? The answer? Corn. Unlike most missionaries, they didn't impose Western ways. Instead, they adopted a Chinese way of life. Their dress was Chinese. In their home, they spoke Chinese. Chester was the first white baby born in Fancheng. And my mother had no milk for me. And I was brought up on the breast of a Chinese woman. Uh, I suppose she, she brought her own baby into the house with her. Uh, and I had to share with, with him. Uh, whoever he was. <laughs> Hannah had been a school teacher in Iowa. In Fancheng, she spent long days preaching. But in three years, she only baptized 12 converts. Her real work was in education. The first women to enter a school in the region's history were in her classes. Chester and his brother Nelius were brought up by their milk mothers and the cook, who taught them the rhymes and riddles, the fables of a culture that predated the teachings of Confucius. A revolutionary movement inspired by Dr. Sun Yat-sen was sweeping the country. The students at the mission studied more than the Bible. Many had memorized the American Declaration of Independence before they could speak English. The, the students in, in my father's school were young revolutionaries. They brought uh, Nelius and me into uh, their meetings. When we learned that they were proposing to throw out the Manchu government, we said, uh, hadn't we better inform our father about this? They called him Lo Hu's Old Whiskers. Oh no, don't, don't, don't you, don't you say anything to him, said Deng Zipei, who was the leader of the group. In Fancheng, Hannah was appalled at the plight of the children. If a family couldn't marry off a baby girl, she'd be left outside the city to die. A lot of them never had a choice because a few hours after they were born they were either brought out the side of the city gate or left on my mother's doorstep. She took them home, raising them as her own children. They became Chester's sisters. When there were too many, she built an orphanage. She refused to allow the binding of feet, the centuries-old crippling of the Chinese woman.
Hannah wrote home to her family in Iowa. We will never get used to the terrible sight of the bodies of little babies being dragged about by scavenger dogs. My sleep is filled with nightmares of suffering children. The work was taking its toll. Halva's concern was growing. He had built a cottage high in the mountains called Shi Liang, rest in the cool, where they escaped the endless work, the stifling heat. But it couldn't restore her health. Hannah was only 39 when she died. I remember very vividly. Well, it was a crushing blow for the children. The Chinese loved her too, you know. Yes, oh, there were hundreds, if not thousands of Chinese that came to the funeral. Hannah and Halva had built up the mission together. How could he carry on the work alone? Throughout China, a great struggle for power was being waged. Most of the country was in the hands of warlords. There was a right wing, later to become the nationalists, under Chiang Kai-shek, supported by the army and the business community. In Chester's region, a left wing, the reformists of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, had organized a coalition of peasants, workers and students. At the school, Chester and Deng Sepei were teaching the principles of Sun Yat-sen. The government should serve the people. The peasants, not the landlords, should own the land. One day as I was uh, standing at the front of the class asking questions in English, all of a sudden they all stood up and they all marched out down to the river. So the whole sandbank was covered with, with students shouting slogans. And we heard them uh, uh, shouting, Da da di Smash imperialism. At last, he was to see his China mission fulfilled. In 1970, Canada finally recognized the People's Republic of China, and at the invitation of his old friend Zhou Enlai, he went home. The house where I live is the smallest in Camros. I'm alone now. Why should I have a big house? Every day, I make myself two Chinese meals. You must come and eat with me. I cook Chinese food for myself twice a day. Putong fan, common food. Yeah. And I use no cookbook. I remember how our cook did it. Call the wind. And they call the wind. Keep on blowing. And the boat is sailing upstream if the sailing is good and you see this panorama against the setting sun it is marvelous then you can function you can pasture your soul with his daughter and granddaughter chester visits his mother's grave Hannah Ronning, born Roram, 1872, home Radcliffe, Iowa, arrived in China, 1891, gone before, 
February 1907. At the family reunion, Chester prepares for the baptism of his great grandchild. Live until you're old, learn until you're old, and there is still so much to learn. The Camrose College, where he was a student 70 years ago. He's 85 now. No, you don't forget. You don't become insensitive just because of age. Being associated with students and young people keeps you young. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is my help and salvation. All ye who will bow to His temple, join Him. to go yet. Okay, give us the key. <clears throat> now softly, softly, follow my time. Okay. Once more, the harmony. Let's have it. Ready? Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him for He Well, I hope that that gave everyone uh, a taste of the film. Uh, it's a beautiful film and there's much more to it than that. So I hope that you'll tune in tomorrow and, and take in the whole thing tomorrow evening. Uh, I should also thank the National Film Board of Canada for uh, preserving and continuing to distribute uh, this wonderful work. Um, but let's go ahead and carry on now and please welcome Mr. Tom Radford to talk with us about uh, the life and legacy of Chester Ronning. Hi, Tom. How are you today? Great. Hi. Hi to everybody. Yeah. So let's, uh, like I said, let's jump right in. Let's use the most of our time here. And, and I'll just start off by asking you to maybe comment briefly on um, what it was like uh, to get to know Ronning. What, what kind of man was he in your experience? Oh, boy. Um, <clears throat> It's a hard question because uh, he was such a um, enormous kind of figure, really. I mean, it seems funny to say that about a, a guy who lived in Camrose, but they, I, I think Chester was what I would call a world figure. Um, and um, he was a very contemporary man. I mean, it's funny watching the film now. It just feels like um, 40 years of where have they gone you know he we it's, it's tragic we don't have people like Chester now with the world facing the climate crisis it's about to face the need I I've been to two or three of these United Nations conferences in the last five years uh, about uh, global warming and there's no Chesters there it's very very um, 
concerning in a sense because he had that ability to work with people in China, work with people in Vietnam, work with people in India, work with people, all sorts of different people in Camrose or up in the Peace River country uh, where his dad had founded a church in Valhalla. Um, and you know, of all the movies I've made over 50 years, I think my favorite scene is that choir at the end of China Mission. Um, you know, it just, to me, that sense of a universal, um, uh, you know, sp spiritualism, uh, I'd never call him, you know, devoutly religious as a person, because I think he was as much Confuci Confucian or Buddhist, he, he just thought all of the, the religions of the world were important. Um, and he just at, at that age of his life, the spirit he brought to those kids in that choir was just was just something to, to, to see. And I was just, just watching the film now, I was thinking, you know, in a funny way, we were all Chester's choir. He was, he was kind of directing um, so many of the people in his life, people like his daughter in New York, uh, Audrey Topping is married to the managing editor of the New York Times. And, and uh, she was, um, so, well, you see her at the grave, at his mother's grave there with uh, Audrey and her daughter. Um, everybody in Camrose, the people he knew in Edmonton, um, Ottawa, uh, Geneva, they were just all, Chester's choir to some extent. Yeah, that's a really beautiful analogy for it. And, you know, choirs bring together folks from so many different backgrounds and, and so many different experiences. And uh, one thing you mentioned was talking about him as a kind of uh, global person um, who could sympathize with lots of different folks from different communities. Uh, and he lived in lots of different places in lots of different communities and interacted with all sorts of different uh, peoples around the world. Um, could you talk or, or comment just some more about how a sense of place and a sense of connection to community, and in his case, connection to multiple communities around the globe, kind of informed the way that you approached the film and, and the way that you got to know him in making the film? I know you commented on some, so you commented some on it already, but um, is there more you could say about that that issue? Yeah, no. Pl <clears throat> place is a uh, a great word, I think, to use in connection to him. And you know, and to me, it's this this great sadness that um, Alberta is sort of losing its sense of place. People like uh, Chester's parents came here to found a place, and as you say. Um, a place of many, many different cultures. And uh, I remember, you know, he was writing a book when I was working with him that sadly never got published. I think he died before it was finished, but it was on the Edson to Grand Prairie Trail because the Peace River country was opening up and um, his dad wanted to, to found this community called Valhalla, kind of a utopian community up in the Peace River country. And Chester would go on and on about all the people he met on that Edson to Grand Prairie Trail, which apparently, I mean, we just roar up there on a highway now, but apparently it was just a horrendous trail, just through muskeg and black flies and, and your wagon sinking down into the mud. And, but for him, it was just this great adventure. And it was this kind of, uh, the way Alberta had come together as a kind of pioneer society. And, uh, and every one of those places, I just don't think there was any place we went with, with Chester that he took for granted. You know, um, each, each the, the little community of Bardo, just outside of, um, of Camrose, which I think is just a graveyard now. Um, you know, that, that had been the beginning of that, that sort of Norwegian community. And um, they all meant so much to him. 
Yeah, it's very interesting. You say, you know, he never took any of these places for granted. There he is sitting with Joe Enlai and, and telling him about his little house in Camros <laughs> and the Chinese meals that he cooks there in his home. You know, so so very, even though he was this global person with, with international diplomatic connections and so on, was still very rooted in his home and his uh, his sense of place. And, and Camrose was a very important aspect of that identity, I think. Um, you know, so speaking of Camrose and, and uh, his house, um, just a quick aside here, as, as you know, the, the house sadly is no more. Um, and as most of our audience probably knows, um, we uh, had to move out of the house in early 2020, just shortly before the pandemic started actually, because the foundation started crumbling. Um, and because of that, that led the university to sell the property. And then um, the new owners were, uh, as far as I understand, were unable to um, restore the foundation and the home. So they decided to take it down. Um, but just on a brighter side, I will add in this, this quick aside here that, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, new, a new family starting a new story there on that same spot where, where Chester uh, forged his story or part of his story. Um, and the Ronning Center gets to move into Founders Hall, you know, that building that your film beautifully ends on. Uh, so we're excited about being in a, in a space that's kind of in the heart of campus in the, in the historic heart of the campus. Um, so there's, there's new things to look forward to. So that's just an aside since the house, you know, and the home plays so prominently in the film. Um, but that leads me to my next question, actually. You know, you shared with me the other day some, some great stories about um, spending time with Chester in that house, in that home. And I wonder if you could comment some on that experience of being in that home with all of those artifacts that he had brought with him and collected through his journeys. And yeah, maybe you could just tell us some about spending time there. Yeah, I mean, I just, from the first time I went to Camrose um, uh, looking for the house, and when I found it and I got out of my car, and there ahead of me was Founders Hall, um, uh, you know, and it just, it all kind of made sense how small a community it had originally been, that he would be living basically half a block away or whatever it was. Um, and I've always thought Founders Hall is, to me, the most beautiful building in Alberta. Um, this, it just seems to, to capture um, Alberta at the turn of the century um, and those, those, those wonderful institutions that were building the province. But when I went into his house, um, it was just um, this treasure trove of, and it wasn't just, um, you know, fancy silks, silks or, or, or ceramics or whatever. Every one of the, um, the, the things he had, we'd pick them off the mantle and tell you the story of them and why he'd hung on to them. And I was, um, my wife and, and, and young son came down with me. And uh, Chester immediately took over. I'm, my, my boy Theo was only two years old or whatever. And Chester showed him around the house rather <laughs> than, than me. And he gave him this beautiful uh, blue horse, just this, about the size of your hand. Um, and that, you know, a gift our family has, has never forgotten. And, and it, it, it just felt like you were at home in his house, right from the beginning, which influenced the whole film. Because so often you make films about important people and they, they can be standoffish or, you know, who are you to invite, invade my life sort of thing. And it wasn't, Chester's life was wide open that way. And then, and the, the house, um, uh, in, in the years to come after that, when I'd go see him, every time I'd go back to the house, I kind of felt like I was going home in a sense. Yeah, it, it was a great space and one that we'll miss very much. But you, know, you mentioned Founders Hall. Um, you know, I don't know if you've had a chance to come down to Camrose since it was, it was renovated, but uh, it was fully renovated and uh, reopened as Founders Hall in, in 2015. So, um, next time, actually, as soon as the pandemic's over, we should we should have you down and, and have you for coffee and 
uh, afternoon snack or lunch or something here on campus and, and give you a tour of the new Founders Hall. See, see how it compares to your time here in the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so uh, we want to have plenty of time for uh, people to interact with you and, and ask some questions of you about your experiences in the film, and we'll get to that. But uh, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, our, our, the title of our event today is, is Chester Ronning's Mission Then and Now. Um, and you worked with Ronning and, and made this film relatively early in your career. I mean, you had established yourself as a filmmaker for sure by then, but, you know, in the earlier portion of your career, you made this film. Um, so you, you, um, you had many films to come in your career. How, how did the making of this film and working with Ronning shape the rest of your career and, and shape your life as a filmmaker? Did it have a particular impact on, on your life and work, this experience with Ronning? Yeah, I, I think it was really important, really important, because my films ended up being about people um, and how, and that's easier said than done in a way, you know, you can make a film about a person and totally miss them. Um, uh, but with Chester, he gave me a lot of confidence in um, I guess in my in myself, I I was as interesting to him as he was to me, um, so that I could I could really the film ended up being a very kind of democratic process. That's just Chester, you know the the wonderful old prairie socialist that he was, um, and um, later you know I I made a Life and Times of Peter Lougheed film where I worked very closely with Peter, I don't think I could have um, uh, known how to do that or, or felt confident in doing that without having worked with Chester. And that was the case of, um, of all the films I ever worked with. I always felt it was what would make a good film was getting close to somebody. If the filmmaker got close to them and they trusted the filmmaker, um, a, a wonderful story would emerge. They'd, they'd feel, you know, the, um, uh, the confidence to share things with you. Um, so, so it really was a very influential film, film for me, I think. It, it, uh, up until then, um, you know, I, I worried if you made a film about, about Peter Lougheed, what on earth would you ask him, you know? You, it just, um, but, but Chester just opened all those doors. Yeah, of course, I, I never knew him personally. Um, he, he passed away long before I ever came to Canada. Um, but just getting to know him through your film and, and through his own, his own uh, memoir and other books written about him, he seemed like an extremely welcoming person. Uh, I run into folks here in, in Camrose who tell me that, who grew up here, who say that, you know, when they were school kids, they, they would, you know, they'd take school trips and stop by his house. And, uh, you know, so he constantly the educator, right? When I talk about Ronning uh, at public events, I often like to emphasize um, his, the educational aspect of his identity, um, because so much is focused on uh, his diplomatic career and his political career, but yeah, was a lifelong educator, a lifelong learner, and willing to share and open up that, that learning uh, to everyone he came in contact with, it seems. So, um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for this film and, and the, the experience of uh, working with him, I'm sure, um, contributed to, to your technique and your craft as a filmmaker. Um, so there's a couple comments that have come in, uh, especially in relation to the house. Um, uh, one attendee, Ed Fu, um, just said uh, that uh, it wanted confirmation that the house has in fact uh, been torn down. And yes, that is true. Um, as I said, um, sadly, just uh, the uh, foundation of the home started to crumble um, in the last few years. Um, the home was built in the 1920s. Um, so a hundred year old home and uh, got to the point where it could no longer be maintained. Um, and then also a, a note from Diane McGall. I have to give a, a shout out, so to speak, to Diane. 
Uh, Diane worked with me at the Ronning Center very closely for a number of years um, as the program coordinator and administrative assistant. She now works at Queen's University in Ontario. Um, but uh, Diane just wanted to say to everyone uh, that uh, she is glad to hear that we are uh, moving into founders and that uh, things are looking on the up <laughs> for Augustana and for the future of, uh, of our campus. Um, hopefully we'll be out of this pandemic and in our, in our normal spaces soon. Um, so we have plenty of time now. I want to make sure people have plenty of uh, time to ask Tom questions. Um, I know many of you have seen this film before, many, maybe years ago. Um, maybe for some of you, this was the first time you'd, you'd seen clips of the film, or maybe this was a reminder of a time you saw the film in the past. Um, so I want to make sure that there's plenty of time. Uh, just a reminder also, if you want to ask questions, there's a Q&A button uh, in your Zoom app interface, which should be there, whether you're using uh, an iPad or phone, or whether you're using a desktop or laptop computer, it, it should be either at the top or the bottom of your screen. And you can just enter a question there at any time. You don't have to wait to be prompted. You can enter a question there and, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, so here's a question um, from Ellen Parker. Uh, and she says um, that she's curious about Chester Ronning's political career especially being the UFA MLA from 1932 to 35. And he was also Alberta's first CCF leader from 40 to 42. Um, and she's asking, has there been much, much research documenting this area, era of his life? And why isn't it more widely known? Um, she says, Chester Ronning seems to be the Stephen Lewis of his day, and it would be enormously important for Albertans to be reminded now of this aspect of his life. So maybe Tom, I, I, I could say a bit about that, but Tom, I don't know if you want to say a bit about that in terms of, you know, um, choosing which eras to focus on. And of course, we haven't seen the whole film yet, so tomorrow we'll, we'll see the whole film. But um, I don't know if you wanted to comment some on his political career and how it factored into your decision-making process about presenting his story in the film. Yeah, um, that's a nice... Uh, uh, idea the thought of him as a kind of a, um, a, a Lewis type figure because I think he was every bit of that. Um, I think his political career was um, sort of shanghaied by the depression. I mean it was um, the United Farmers had been some people think Alberta's best government um, some people think Brownlee, the premier, was the best premier that Alberta ever had. Um, but 1935, uh, <laughs> nobody survived, you know, the, <clears throat> the whole rise of fundamentalism in Alberta, uh, so driven by, by that depression, by the dirty 30s. Um, uh, but Chester, you know, uh, remained uh, such an activist through through that period as, as you say up until 1942 you know actually head of the CCF here um, he um, it's interesting what you said earlier about place uh, I was just thinking about that that um, How it connects to his politics, in a sense, is is, is just. Um, I mean, there's there's one of the stories he loved to tell was he was run, running against um, a, uh, a liberal candidate, I think, in the 32 or 33 by-election in Camrose, and um, the uh, at a big town hall meeting. There had been sort of a bit of a, of a racist campaign run against him. And, and the guy he was running against um, said, uh, you know, Mr. Ronning, I, I have it on fairly good authority that you were uh, raised on the milk of a Chinese woman. And, you know, the, sort of a um, shudder through the hall. What was Chester going to say to this? And... 
And he looked at this guy, I think Vestrick was his name, um, and said, um, well, you know, I have an unfairly good authority that you were brought up on the milk of a cow. <laughs> And, and, that, and that was Chester, right? He, he um, you know, always had a way of disarming. He wasn't the kind of person as in politics who would tear down the opposition. I think he would try to find ways, you know, in, in the legislature um, where people could work together because they, they were up against the depression. And... Um, and, you know, it's interesting, his last hurrah, if you like, I think he was in his 70s, um, is that uh, I think it was Trudeau who asked him to go uh, to Hanoi as the peace representative to try to, to stop the Vietnam War before it just got out of control quite early in the war, I think. And, um, and because the Vietnamese trusted him, the Chinese trusted him, um, and uh, he was from America, you know, he is, a lot of his family was, was in the United States. Uh, he, um, but when he was there, um, you know, at the peace table, with Ho Chi Minh and the, the Chinese, I, you know, Joe and Lai may even have come down, I don't know, because Chinese very involved. The Americans started bombing Hanoi as the peace conference was going on. And Chester just couldn't believe, I mean, his, I think his idea of place was, if you're invited to somebody, somebody's place uh, uh, as a, <clears throat> diplomat as a, as a foreign emissary, you show the greatest respect to the, those, that person's place. And to him, the beginning of that bombing, um, absolutely un, un, no warning of it, was, was just some enormous uh, code of conduct had been broken. And he went to the New York Times, he went to the London Times, and he said, this is just unacceptable. And um, uh, that was the end of his diplomatic career, right there, because uh, Canada wasn't gonna have some two-bit diplomat tell the United States that they, they, they couldn't bomb Vietnam, right? So, so interesting that that political career went all the way to the 1970s. And, um, he, and, and he, when, you, when you talk to him about it, he wasn't bitter about it. He, un, he understood what you could and couldn't do as a diplomat, but he was going to break the rules because he thought um, so, so, uh, the world had to know. Yeah, he, he certainly had a, a talent for um, sitting down with people who are coming from different perspectives. And unfortunately, in that particular case, and I say this as an American, <laughs> the Americans weren't interested in hearing other perspectives uh, on the issues in, in that particular situation. Um, to Ellen's question, though, about resources and about, you know, even just general discourse about his political career, about his socialist ties and, and, and socialist roots in terms of his political positions, um, it really doesn't get talked about too much. Uh, I think part of that has to do with the political history of our province and especially our riding here in Camrose. Um, but I will say, and I just happen to have this next to me, uh, it normally would just be on the shelf right over here, but uh, um, this book by the U Alberta historian Brian Evans, I don't know if this is backwards on your screen or not, but um, the remarkable uh, Chester Ronning, Proud Son of China, um, which was published by the U of A Press uh, and the Chester Ronning Center. Actually, it was co-published by U of A Press and the Chester Ronning Center in 2012, I think, 2013. Um, I'm not sure if it's still in print, um, but I think that um, it's still available out there. And uh, Evans actually devotes quite a bit of space into the, in this book to Ronning's uh, political career. So for those of you listening, if, if you're interested in, in reading up more about Ronning and, and his political career in Alberta in the 30s and early 40s, and then 
of course, how that um, served as a foundation for his second trip into China and then for coming uh, or then traveling around as a diplomat, a Canadian diplomat in many different locales around the globe. Uh, it's a very good read. It is an academic history, so he's got lots of footnotes, but it's very readable, very interesting. And it, along with Tom's film, this has been a, a great resource for me to learn about Ronning himself. Um, kind of shifting gears a little bit, but of course it's all related because I think Ronning's kind of philosophy and approach to life influenced everything he did. But um, Agnes Hovland, who uh, is a city councilor here in Camrose and, and a CLC alum and uh, has uh, strong ties to our campus here. She's wondering if, Tom, if you could comment on any insights that surfaced uh, regarding his philosophy of education during the time you, you spent with him. Did he talk much about his, his time as an educator or his approach to education? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I wanted um, to do something that, that um, tied him to the Camrose Lutheran College, as it was called in those days. And um, it, was, uh, it was Chester, I think, who suggested the choir scene. And so I think there's something that's what, why I think it's such a powerful scene is I think within it is a lot of his idea of education, you know, that um, the, the choir is a classroom, the, the, um, those, he would take that choir across the province. So would, would, would visit other communities. They, there were a lot of, I think, sort of like choral festivals or con contests in those days, you know, when before, uh, it's not exactly before radio, but just at the same time as radio coming forward, probably on CKUA, there would have been the choir, the choir singing. But, but I think, you know, this idea of outreach, um, the uh, those were the halcyon days of the Department of Extension at the University of Alberta, um, you know, which were uh, doing so many programs with people like like Chester in places like Camrose, you know, and um, that that the more democratic you could make education, um, uh, the um, the better society you could build, you know, that education was, was quite, quite critical. It's very interesting, all this controversy these days about rewriting the curriculum. I, you know, I think, I think Chester would have been quite shocked that you don't teach about residential schools in this new curriculum. You know, he probably would have gone to residential schools as the first thing that you'd, <laughs> you'd study, you know, because um, education was going to create um, the kind of society Alberta would become. I mean, tremendously exciting times, you know, um, that, he, that he lived through. I mean, when you think of it, he was um, just a little boy in 1905 when the province was was created and and he saw it all the way up to 1980 and um, he although he was he <laughs> he and he always was thinking about stuff you know he always had five things on his mind I remember one day uh, he had stayed at the Shadow Look Home and um, we had done some stuff around town done some filming and I went to say goodbye to him and uh, we spent two hours looking for his car in the car park of the Shadow Lacombe. <laughs> he thought it was on the second floor, and in fact, it was on the eighth or something. Uh, but that was Chester, you know, and, then, and that whole time looking for the car, he was talking about five other things, you know, that he thought were important. Kind of classic absent-minded professor, educator, constantly and juggling multiple things and telling multiple stories and yeah absolutely um, yeah um so a couple things uh come to mind there one just in response to agnes's question as well um you know chester did a an ma thesis on education with the university of alberta that he finished in 1942 um, right before he went back to china and 
Um, we actually have a couple copies of it here at Augustana. So if you're an alum, you can come have access to the library and check it out. It's very interesting as a piece of history for CLC because it's a kind of a case study on the educational approach to CLC. Um, and he draws on the philosophy of Dewey and, and others in relation to social democracy and social democracy as a kind of benchmark and, and foundation for good education. Um, and talks about how even a parochial school like a Lutheran college can contribute to a social democratic uh, philosophy in education. Um, so that's a great resource too, for those of you who might be interested in Ronning's approach to education and also the history of education here at, at our campus. Um, you mentioned, of course, the curriculum um, and uh, residential schools. Of course, in the last uh, number of years since the TRC released its report, I think nationwide we can say that we have been slowly struggling to recognize, um, and I speak from the position as a white settler, uh, recognizing the hard truths and, and uh, tragic truths um, of our relationship with indigenous peoples. And then of course, in recent weeks, um, those hard truths have come quickly and uh, uh, tragically, I can't think of a better word or another word. Um, but um, this brings me to a question that, that someone has asked in the chat, a question from Bobby uh, Valancourt, who's a, a Camrosian a friend of mine, um, actually. And she's wondering if you could comment some on Ronning's interactions with the First Nations, First Peoples, Indigenous Peoples of Canada. Um, did, did that come up at all? Or do you, do you have um, any personal experiences about him uh, talking about his interaction with Indigenous Peoples in, in Alberta? Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. I, I didn't. Um, that's not to say um, that, that that wasn't um, a concern for him. Although I would say that because of his growing up in China, um, because of the head tax um, that was imposed on Chinese immigrants coming into Canada, um, Chester's sense of racism seemed to be more directed towards immigrants coming into the country. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember at the same time um, that I was working with him, a grocery store um, down in southern Alberta, just out in the middle of the prairie, a place like, um, what was it called, Grand Coulee or, doesn't matter, um, an, an old Chinese gentleman and his wife, and his wife had disjoined him, this would be in the mid-70s, and he had come into Canada in 1911. And in all those years, they'd never allowed his wife to come and join him running their grocery store in Southern Alberta. And it just, you know, so that kind of racism, um, uh, something that Chester felt, um, you know, part of our tragedy. And I, and I think he would have, he would have thought, the same about residential schools and about First Nations, um, but we never encountered that in the film. We, ne we never went there. It's probably my fault. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I in saying this, I, I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression. I, I don't want to um, suggest uh, anything in relation to Ronning and his own personal positions, which I didn't know, but I think that the fact that you have someone who was so deeply in tuned with how societies can be racist towards peoples from other places and even even peoples indigenous peoples within their own lands um, that that it it doesn't seem to have been a part of his story to interact with and to defend the indigenous peoples of Alberta, it, it's in a way a kind of indictment of our settler society generally, that this has been something that we as a collective, you know, you know settlers from Europe and, and elsewhere um, have turned a blind eye to this uh, for the most part. And then those that didn't turn a blind eye were active in the oppression and subjugation of, of indigenous peoples. So, um, yeah, I don't, don't want to take it down, you know, I don't want to turn too, too far towards, uh, um, you know, 
tragic and, and sad issues, but um, I think it's worth highlighting for sure. And, and thanks, Bobby, for asking that question, because I, I do think it's indicative of, you know, um, many white settlers in the 20th century who just didn't think about this issue or were unaware of this issue. And I think we have a lot of work to do to, to first know the, the truths um, of our relationship with, with the first peoples of the land, and then also to, to try to work towards reconciliation and be constantly working towards that. So, um, and I think Ronning can be an inspiration there, right? Even though he wasn't active in that kind of work, he was certainly active in um, many other, on many other fronts in relation to reconciling the differences and uh, the challenges that people face trying to live together on our globe. Um, so I think he can be an inspiration in that process. I think, uh, you know, um, I was just going to say that um, in his diplomatic career, um, and it, I think one of his mo most important postings was to India as the, um, the Canadian representative in Delhi, whatever. You know, and he was a close friend of Nehru he was a close friend of Madame Gandhi. At the time when the, the horrible kind of racial warfare in India was, 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 was also um, uh, coming forward to the surface. And, um, you know, I, I think he was such a conciliator. Um, if, if, I think if he'd been alive today, he'd be very involved in the First Nations issue, but, but I think you're right. I mean, that was a blind spot for the entire society in, uh, in the 1960s or 70s. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, I think I've uh, gone through most of the, or the questions we've had. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, I, uh, one thing I learned teaching on Zoom is that often you have to kind of take these these awkward silences in stride. And sometimes when there's no questions coming in, you just have to wait a moment. And then all of a sudden you'll get a whole flood of them. So <laughs> so we'll see. But does anyone else have another question for for Tom Radford and, and uh, uh, for him about his experience working with Ronning and making this wonderful film? No, well, I'm not seeing any come in. Uh, I will then, we've got just a couple minutes, so I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Tom, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Uh, thank you so much for your film, for documenting Ronning's life. And, and you know, it really showed in the, um, in the short, in the abbreviated version we watched earlier as well, that it's not just a documentary about Ronning, it's about his family as well. Um, about his mother and father, about the school they established in Fancheng. And um, so it's, it's a really, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's a true memorial to the Ronning legacy. And it's one of the best memorials we have to that legacy. So thank you so much for your work. And uh, thank you for, for uh, virtually visiting the Augustana campus today. Oh, well, thank you. I've enjoyed it a great deal. Yeah. All right, well, I will uh, say goodbye to Tom. And so you're welcome to sign off if you like, Tom. And then I'll just close with a few uh, brief announcements here. Um, remember tomorrow evening, we have uh, the screening of the full version of China Mission, which begins at 7 p.m. Uh, mountain time. Uh, and uh, you can register for that uh, and to receive the Zoom link and receive all the information you need to see the film. Uh, on the Chester Ronning Center website. Um, and then also a special event, our, our third event of this uh, Augustana 110 celebration uh, is a conversation with David Goa and Dittmar Mundell. Uh, David Goa, of course, is the founding director of the Chester Ronning Center and Dittmar Mundell uh, is a professor emeritus of religious studies here at Augustana and also served as an associate director of the center. So we're going to have a, a great conversation with the two of them about the founding of the center uh, and about their work in uh, the early years of the center's existence here on campus. Uh, so um, thank you again. We look forward to seeing you at those events. 
and uh, hopefully in person sometime in the near future as uh, we continue to um, fight off this, this pandemic. So thank you again. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.